GovCon day two. How are we feeling? Good. Good. Try to play some music just to get the energy going here. Today, uh, the talk is on mastering the CDN, past, present, and future. And it's my hope in the next 45 minutes or so to give you all sort of an overview of CDN technology, but really talk about stuff that goes beyond just the basics of what CDNs can do and try to give people a sort of like up to the minute kind of like futuristic, where is a lot of this world going? Um, that plus whatever notifications pop up on my iPad and any other questions we all might have. Um, but just to get going, quick show of hands, who's like using a CDN right now on their websites? And of those, and who's not using a CDN but wants to? Excellent, excellent. I'm gonna hope that's most of the room because I think that one of the things that's been very important to me, my name is Matthew Cheney, I work at Pantheon doing web ops, and one of the things that we're very comfortable in doing is trying to make fast and uh, scalable websites. And part of that is making sure that your websites are, are fast and responsive. Because one of the things that might be familiar to folks are sort of emails that you might get like this from customers or your agency or other people that are relying on you to build and deliver a fast website. This is totally real uh, that came, I, I would help out with this bicycle company. It has a website. They were launching a Kickstarter. Like it's about to go out and then you go to this link and it shows a bunch of beautiful slideshow images of these bicycles, but it's really slow. It's the kind of thing that we all know in our head, slow websites are not gonna be converting websites, they're not gonna be enticing websites. They're certainly not gonna be websites we wanna buy products or read about information because speed is relevant to user experience. It's one of the most relevant things that study tells us. And so when I'm like, look getting an email though, talking about, oh, there's something slow I think one of the things, and this matters a lot when we start talking about time to first byte and other kinds of like uh, of things, is slow can mean different things to different people. And one thing that on a sort of CDN level is really important is to be able to actually start to take measurements of how fast and slow things are. And this sort of gets us to, to why we want CDNs. Because we can use tools like New Relic to actually evaluate on any specific page load how long each things are taking. And this is sort of the core of like making fast websites. Because when I put to you that CDNs are really important for the web, it's basically because I expect, as a web user, I expect stuff to be fast. CDNs provide that. I expect stuff to be secure. CDN can provide that. These kind of graphs, though, are helpful because they can explain how long things take. For those that don't like play New Relic on the regular, the blue area is sort of the PHP processing time. The yellow area is sort of the database processing time. And then this green spike here is this external services time. And this is a real graph from around the time I got the email that basically showed that something on the site was going on that was making it slow. Something was risking this launch of this new bicycle product. And with inside of like New Relic and inside of performance on the web, you can be very specific about drilling down to what specifically is taking each microsecond of time. And by looking at our website on this, this bicycle website, I noticed really quickly that there's this like image uh, x.net address that's taking a lot of external calls. And in many cases, it's taking a very long time to deliver. And when I look at that and dig deeper, it's sort of a remote image hosting site the folks who had built the landing page for the bicycle product had included a lot of this, and it can be very slow. Especially because this particular link, unlike the rest of the entire website, was not behind a CDN. And because and CDNs are really important. Cache rules a lot of how the web works. If you've been developing with Drupal for a while, you know Drupal itself has internal caches. The uh, database themselves have different caches. The, C, the Varnish and CDN products have different caches. Every piece of the stack, every layer of the stack is cached 
because this helps to provide the speed and efficiency that we want on the web while still allowing us to change stuff on the back end so that it can all work. And so one thing that was really important in sort of the story of trying to make a fast website page for this bicycle store is that we can't have this kind of purple external calls. Like these are it's simply taking too long to do our responses. And that's why if we just go ahead and move the items away from this non-CDN item and instead move it off into a CDN thing, suddenly all of this time that we were spending generating external pages goes away. And that we're able to save the users who are going to our site seconds upon seconds upon seconds of time. And I start with this story because I think like, especially for people that aren't as familiar with CDNs or what they use, that they do, that things on the web take different amounts of time to get created. And at the baseline, what you're doing as a web developer or as a site owner is you're providing a bunch of HTML and image files and other assets that are created by Drupal and sent over the internet to other people. But then in a world where like um, having your entire situation be just a bunch of like HTML, if the home page is the same for everyone who looks at it, we don't need to go through the same energy over and over again to regenerate it. And that what a CDN is on some level is it's simply a cache of what the page looks like to one person and it's a set of business judgments about do can I just give that same page to the next person or I do need to do spend a lot of time to actually rebuild those assets and re recreate those, those image, image elements and HTML. And so in this case, that if folks are familiar with sort of varnish as a caching kind of layer, varnish is a lovely solution that was developed and used very heavily in the building of CDNs and the caching of content where you basically say for any given website, I want to look at every request that comes in and I want to see if that request is something that I've done before or done in a way before that's easy to modify. And Varnish has a bunch of different options where you can basically say, I'm going to publish a blog post. That blog post is going to contain images in HTML in a certain form. And Varnish will be smart enough to know every time someone goes to the blog post, if they just need to see the contents of the post, you can just kick them back this HTML and image files. You do not need to do anything else. And that's revolutionary. The downsides to some of these approaches, though, come about, and does that, that makes sense to everyone? The idea of like just a, a, a cache, like, hey, going to the website, website could spend five seconds building the page, but if you already know what to build, you can just ship it off. And Varnish lives in memory too, so it's a very fast kind of thing. Problem we run into, as is a trouble in the world of physics, is the problem of the speed of light. One of the things that has to happen in order for like the internet to work is you have these like really long cords underneath the oceans that transmit light. That's what fiber optic cords are. And this is a map, at least of some point in the, the, the not, not so distant past, of all the different connection points between the world. And this is what happens if you're sitting here in Washington, you know, DC area, and you're trying to connect into Europe to like get a website over there, your data is going to have to transmit across the Atlantic Ocean. That thing is also true, you want to go down to Australia, you have to transport across the Pacific Ocean. And this actually takes time. It takes time for the speed of light to go around the Earth. It's not very much time. But one of the things on the internet that happens, and if you've ever looked at like a trace route or some other kind of analysis of how your traffic patterns work, is that every time I'm trying to connect to like, your, your uh, server, I'm actually hopping around to different points. And part of the internet like op algorithms do try to optimize those hops, but that, you know, especially because every time I make a request, I have to do the same hops. And when we start talking about things like HTTP 1 and, and TLS uh, connections, we have multiple times we have to go back and forth. And this becomes a problem that is that even like very individual good caching solutions cannot solve. Because these are just some basic like distances between various uh, parts of the world. We got a you know, city in Australia, 
got some stuff in, in North America, New Orleans where I live, uh, Rome over in Europe. And you can start to see sort of the intersections of this kind of thing. That a, you know, a user in Paris who wants to go talk to someone in Australia is going to have to spend, pay functionally a 300 millisecond tax to be able to even say hello to that person and the other users. And these are the kinds of things that add up. That if I'm consistently trying to go to websites that are, well, that are a good distance away from me, that every time I'm going to have to wait, not a ton, but 300 milliseconds is like, you know, like almost a third of a second. Like, that certainly can add up. And a lot of good research suggests that that's true, in fact, that people who uh, you have to wait longer for sites will inevitably some percentage drop off after every half second of, of delay. And what Global CDNs try to do then instead is they say, look, like, we want to take this concept of being able to cache entire pages or entire assets. And instead of just having them be in one place where a varnish server on a single configuration could access, we're going to like fly around and put caches of your website in all of these different places around the world. And so here's a map of one CDN kind of network. These are data centers around the world where people have cached versions of their sites. And there's been a lot of companies that have sort of developed technologies around this. One of the things that's really important in this kind of mod model is that you know, when I make a change to my site, when I publish a new blog post or I add additional content, I want that cached copy to distribute as quickly as possible all around the world. And having these kind of servers work together is a really good plan. It's also one that I think is something that like only, you know, in the last few years have a lot of these CDNs become things that are kind of things that are like relatively affordable for normal websites to buy, have become better integrated into like web hosting platforms that will deploy them for you, and are things that have a lot of custom configurations that we can talk about that can let you do impressive things, far more than just like what Drupal can generate on its own, and in a way that very much looks like in my view, sort of the future of, of edge side computing. Because we need the smart pipes in the world. We have to not only do this very like, like important and necessary work of not making Drupal bootstrap every single time it's going to generate the exact same thing, but we can also build additional features and intelligences into our CDNs that can help them be smarter and can help facilitate a lot of like goals that we may have as web developers or, or as, as site owners and, uh, and, and folks who, who care about the web. And so this is a bunch of uh, cloud providers that are out there. This talk, of course, is not specifically uh, recommending any, any specific ones. Um, Akamai is probably the oldest, uh, definitely has been around for the longest uh, time and is you know, definitely more of a pre premium option Although, in recent years, a lot of other smaller companies have sort of been biting at the heels of those market leaders. In part because there's a lot that CDNs do beyond just caching the home page. And the more features and the more advanced customizations you can do, the better your web experience is going to be for your, for your users. And a lot of what this talk really is about in terms of mastering the CDN is sort of to some extent assuming that you're setting one up, that you're taking your domain name, pointing that domain name at a CDN provider, going to the CDN provider, configuring the appropriate origin of the rules, and then that works. And then where do we go from there? Like what else can we do than just turn on caching for our site? Because there's a lot of possibilities here. And not to say, if you, all you do is turn on CDN for your site, something I, by the way, recommend everyone here do for, a web, for websites that they are, they're running. Just turning it on helps you an immense amount with respect to loads, respect to the global distribution. But you can really dial in additional stuff that offers like much, much more important um, uh, tips for, for mastering your CDN and really getting, getting the most out of the tech. So I would say the first and probably biggest tip I would like talk to you about, which is you know, no easy, easy matter sort of dealing with cache invalidation, is this idea that when we're caching pages for the website, 
we want to be as smart as possible. So if we have a website with 100 pages, we want to have 100 pages live in the cache. But when we go ahead and make a change to our existing website, there's this problem that exists where I have to tell as the website, my cache and CDN layer, that the blog post has changed, the home page has changed, or n number of other smaller pages on the site have changed. And this is actually a really difficult problem to do in the context of a lot of cache strategies. Because if you just simply do like a clear all caches kind of approach in a Drupal context on a, on a fast website that has a lot of users, it creates this problem of a cache stampede where suddenly your, your server, which might have been okay to generate one or two or even one or 200 pages a minute, is suddenly asked to regenerate all 10,000 pages it has or something like this. And this creates a uh, unfortunate problem that will actually crash, crash your site. And that the really smart people who are doing CDN work today are very smart about leveraging a selective cache and validation logic. And in the world of Drupal, uh, it's this idea of a cache tag, something that Drupal 8 builds into its framework directly, something that Drupal 7 can get through a series of backport kind of options. And what Drupal 8 cache tags are, and it's one of the probably the most important things if you really want to make your CDN excellent, if you want to use it to its fullest, what you want to do is pursue a strategy where you heavily hook into the cache API layer of Drupal. We are basically able to set up a situation where you're going to say, I have 10,000 pages on my site, and I'm going to get those all put into cache for as long as I possibly can, in some cases weeks or days. And then only then, if I see a necessary change to one of those pages, then I will go ahead and invalidate the cache and force, force a rebuild for those assets specifically. And Drupal makes it easy because Drupal knows a lot of stuff under the hood about making pages. That if you look at like a blog page in a Drupal application, Drupal's gonna know that there's a view that has some settings that define what that page is, that there's some node, some node, uh, node types that are like involved, that they have fields that have different formatters. It knows which configuration settings are bundled on each page, it knows, um, you know, what node IDs or user IDs are relevant to the construction of the page. And that this is information that you can leverage directly in the cache API. That you can make these kind of like, you know, cache n kind of decisions where you can say, maybe every time I like post a new Facebook post for my site, I want to update a bunch of links to my site. And then on the back end, we can go to set individual uh, cache tags for all the different elements we want. Because we want to build out we want to build out stuff like this. Where here's a web page that we built in um, uh, in Drupal 8. And you can see we've got some different like entities that have been placed there. We've got a menu, there's some configuration, you know, a few views presumably. And that we want to be able to reduce this kind of thing right here to something that looks like this where each of these different tags, node 1, 10, node 11, file 56, view hero view, view locations, user 1, these are all tags that are necessary in order to make the CDN know that these items make up this page, and that we can do really cool stuff. Like we can make, and there's a module in Drupal that does this, um, that basically analyzes all of the cache tags that come out of Drupal at self, here's a live example of just like a straight install of a theme. And you're actually able to take, take those cache tags and do something like this. Be able to say, in a situation where the, the location's view has been changed, find every site on the page on the site that happens to have the location's views embedded and make that clear the cache. And that's something that I think is very, very powerful because now you can play this game of I have 10,000 pages, they all exist in cache. If I make a change, only those pages that have to have the cache will be rebuilt, anything else is fine. And that's something that you can get pretty easily. Uh, there's uh, cache contacts are a way to expand this even further so that you're able to make sure that you're very specific about I only want to clear stuff that I want. And that's something I would just say in your caching strategy First and foremost, you want to master your CDN, 
you want to try to set all of your content to as long as possible in the cache and be smart about invalidating the cache when you need to do so. Question? Yes. Uh, are cache tags generally well supported across several CDN providers or? Yes. The cache tags are very well supported across different providers. If you integrate a to add sort of needed Drupal module that will then talk to the Cloudflares and the Fastly's of the world. Most of those CDN providers have provided modules in Drupal's contri con contributed space that offers access to those APIs. Because you sort of need to be able to tell the CDN that, hey, like this cache tag needs to expire on all these pages, so you need a connector for it. And a lot of those CDNs publish those. Uh, and uh, and that's a good way to proceed. And sort of whatever CD you have, search on Drupal, find the find the integration one. And... Next tip. Next tip I go through with that CDNs do that I think are really is really important to sort of what we're up to. So beyond just caching content, and CDNs of course will cache our images. That's just part of what the CDN does. It takes images that we have on our site and stores them all around the world, giving us the closest one. We have. But one of the things that happens on the web is that you have different users that approach the site with different speeds, different devices, different sort of uh, requirements on like what they even can support. And so one thing that a lot of modern CDNs can do is you can, through just configuration, just literally changing settings on the CDN, you can do things like say, hey, like if the user is on a 3G or less mobile connection, literally serve them a different image, like quality, different image quality than if they're on more of a, a fiber or high speed connection. And that this is all done without you having to like cut, use Photoshop to cut up different versions of images. This in fact is done without you even having to do image presets or image cache style Drupal configuration. That the CDN literally assesses the like device capability on the other end, assesses the speed of that, of that device and then is able to on the fly reformat literally every image on your site. And it's just something that you get sort of for free by using the CDN because the CDN is, um, is processing all of those images. And that's something I think that can have a huge impact in just like overall performance on a mobile device if you are able to deliver mobile sized appropriate images. Obviously as front end developers, those are things we could build into our web app. We could have a progressive loading kind of function. We could easily do, you know, do device detection in Drupal. But having the CDN do this stuff is, is way better because the CDN is smart about this. And these are problems that every, every website has, not just individual Drupal ones. And I think it's part of what I see as a huge trend in edge computing uh, to be able to say, whatever is a problem for the web generally, if the, ca if, the cash if the CDN layer can solve it, it just takes less responsibility off of the developers who themselves are trying to build websites. You know, like, if we're trying to make judgments about like, cutting up different kinds of sized images and making three versions of every logo we put on the site so that each, each different bandwidth uh, can have them, this is just work that we don't need to do. Let's have the, the CDN do it and we can get this kind of uh, functionality. Again, just settings, settings on the back end. The other thing you can do, and this is probably one of the real limitations, if, you're, if you haven't been using a CDN, but maybe have been doing a lot of A-B testing, the idea of sort of showing one version of a page, seeing what happens to a subset of those users, showing a different use, version of the page, seeing what happens. This is actually something that can be very difficult to do in a cache kind of context. Like, if I have an online store, I maybe want to show two versions of a Buy It Now button, and so I have an image that says buy it now, one's in red, one's in green, which one is more likely to produce people clicking on it or buying. Um, the problem is if I'm just caching everything at the edge, if I'm not actually creating any kind of uniqueness to my request, then I'm not actually gonna be able to properly A-B test because the cache will just serve the same thing to everyone and, and now I don't get any of this important data. And one of the ways that you can sort of leverage this, and folks like Optimizely that do this kind of stuff will integrate with CDNs to provide this kind of, of thing. So something like the HTTP very header is something that can be sent, and you can actually start to segment your groups. That you don't have to set cookies, you don't have to collect personal information, but on the edge you're able to say, for the homepage, show 20% of this people's homepage, 20% of these people's homepage, 
and then see what happens next, and you can get that data. And there's a lot of really, Fastly has a good blog post on this kind of series of doing it. But it's something also that like takes the strain off of your specific applications, right? Like it's hard enough just making Drupal websites and getting them to meet your content and business and organizational requirements. So in cases where you do want to do more advanced stuff, integrate with more like AB kind of platforms, having the edge be the ones that says 20% gets this, 30% gets this, way more powerful than trying to do do that in um, inside inside the inside the, the, the Drupal application. The other advantage that CDNs have, and something I think that really helps to dial in when you're picking a CDN provider is really helpful, is assessing how many different like uh, failover cases or how many different points of presence each CDN provider has. It's not necessarily that like you have to have every, it be in every single city, like that's not really as important, but you need to have global coverage that reflects where most of your users are and often redundant coverage where the users are the most frequented. Because the cloud and working in the cloud, like there's a lot of weather that happens. Servers do just go offline and disappear. Connections you think are gonna be strong are very strange. Data centers have weird stuff that happens where you know, fiber optic cord gets cut or power fluctuates or gets overwhelmed. And having a CDN allows you to read, to distribute out that load. The CDNs are really smart. So you can hit the CDN and it can say, I'm gonna serve this item from cache server one, this item from cache server two, from cache server three. And it can facilitate this kind of raw, 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 round, round robin kind of experience for your users. And this allows for very seamless failover as well. That if you do have a server that's going with having a trouble, instead of having it constantly be sort of continually hit, you know, if you've got four servers, one goes down, traditionally 25% of your traffic will like be like not working anymore. But in a situation where you're doing appropriate load balancing, even if one goes down, you could redistribute the load among the other three and continue, continue going. And this is a problem that CDNs like sort of solve as part of their core business proposition. And I think that's something that's been really interesting to see sort of on the web is that having these companies whose job it is to sit at the like origin of, or at like the, the front of your, of your website to handle all of your traffic starts to build solutions for managing that far beyond what maybe you might do on your own in your own kind of context. And that's a huge win um, in, my, in my experience with the CDNs is having that load balancing tech. Um, the other item is that I think security, obviously extremely important for the CDNs. Something that, you know, you might not think in a sort of cash environment, it's necessarily exactly what CDN should do, but internet, of course, very dangerous. And a lot of that danger though is in the same way that, you know, people who are trying to hack WordPress sites or Drupal sites are using similar signatures for payloads. People are going to you know, known vulnerable pathways. People are trying things that other people have tried before. And one of the things that's awesome for a CDN is because the CDN is sitting in front of all of your traffic. Anybody who wants to go to your site first goes to the CDN, and then if the CDN thinks it's a good request that passes it on to you to actually deliver, the CDN's in a unique position to do things like say, no, like this request is malicious or this request is, is, is abusive, or this, this request is some automatic attack. Let's stop like a DDoS attack from happening because we're sitting right in the middle of that. And that, you know, not to say that you shouldn't be patching and updating Drupal, of course, because you should, but there is a reality to when Drupal releases new security updates, there's a real understanding of how those, uh, those security vulnerabilities can be exploited. And that's something that if you have an appropriate CDN sitting there that knows about the attacks, they can stop. Um, and one thing that I think is really excellent to totally be on the lookout for in the Drupal world is this thing called Drupal Sewer, Seward, which you can chat with the Drupal Association folks outside. It basically is a partnership between the different CDN providers that are out there and the different hosting companies and the Drupal security team because when you have a vulnerability like Drupal get in that was very, very impactful uh, on the platform or any future update security issue that comes out, instead of just like saying, okay, the world, it's Wednesday, here's the security issue for Drupal, here's the patch to fix it, everyone go update, where it creates this sort of tension, right? Where like the moment the world knows about the vulnerability, they can backport it and they can exploit it. 
And then it's sort of a race to see, who, you know, can you weaponize the exploit or can you patch your site? Drupal Sewer is, is nice because it allows you, if you're sort of connected into the CDN program, to as soon as the Drupal security team releases a vulnerability and says, here's the patch file, they also release a firewall rule. So here's also the firewall rule to block this request, even if the site is unpatched. And then that's something the CDN can use to basically secure all of its Drupal 8, Drupal 7 sites at the same time. And that this is the kind of, this is a huge advance in the world of, of website security. Like before it really was like you get an email, your site is, un, is, is not updated, update now to get secure. Using a CDN, you can have that security from the get-go by using a CDN to simply block any malicious traffic from coming your way. Great way to really sort of, sort of dial in, dial in that, that CDN. Uh, last, few, last few things, um, just sort of, you know, in this mid-afternoon kind of vibe. Um, one thing that obviously people are super into is uptime and making sure that your site is responsive to the public and available to the people that need it. And one of the things that can be obviously very frustrating uh, if you look at your site and it's down and you get like a 404 page or you get like a white page or something is just clearly not working, that this... This is something that we can get rid of basically altogether on at least the like public web. Because if I'm running a federal agency website and I want this website to at least be responsive, what I can do is implement something called grace mode. Where grace mode will basically say, for the homepage, keep the homepage in cache for as long as is possible. But if the homepage goes out of cache, and you need to rebuild it, spend, you know, ask Drupal to generate it again. If there's some problem with that, right? If there's some issue where it can't, if the cache is expired, but it can't find the new asset, it can't build the new homepage, the server might be down, there might be an issue, that grace mode basically says the last known good version of your page is going to be way better than a 404 page. Like, if I'm trying to go to a website, I'd rather see what it looked like an hour ago when it was working then see a thing that says 404 not working right now. And, and CDNs are implementing this kind of technology so that you'll never have, if you're running in this kind of model, you're never going to see a not found or doesn't work message. You're just going to see the last known good version of it, which in many, many cases is, is, is better. Now, obviously, there's some limitations to this, like because you're not actually touching an origin, you, know, you're not, you are, of course, not getting the most up-to-date comment or post. And, you know, if you do have to log in or do something more, you know, in interactive with the site, obviously it's not going not gonna to help you. But in many cases where all you want to do is just publish information to the web. You just want to let people know about what's going on with your organization or your company or your operation. Making sure that the CDN is instructed to always give the last known good version instead of a 404 page just improves the like, you know, minds and, 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 and happiness of everyone involved. You won't get calls saying the website's down. You might get a call that says the website doesn't have my blog post posted yet. But that's like a way better, way better conversation to have in my, in, my, in my experience. And so it's called grace mode and varnish. Sometimes it's always on mode. Uh, people call it different names. But it's something if like having 100% uptime is good for what you're up to and necessary for maybe your organizational message, something like this can be implemented implemented very, very easily. Um, another trick the CDNs can do, and something that especially if you're responsible for a few different kinds of web properties, and you're trying to keep it all under like a, a, single, a single domain name that can be really helpful, is that you can do something called domain masking. So I see this a lot in like working with university uh, folks, although I'm sure, and, and, or although it exists everywhere, where what you end up with is a server that has maybe the main website, and then there's these like subdirectories, like slash blog, that itself is a WordPress installation, or slash forum that might be like a Drupal installation. And that's fine, I mean, that's, that's sort of how you build out this stuff. But there's some issues when you have like multiple CMS applications in the same server space, same file system space, or sort of this, you end up with a situation where if my blog gets hacked, it's then easy to like use the blog, uh, the hack to the blog to extend the hack to the forum or the main site because they're all just sitting in the same folder and can presumably read each other's credentials depending on how you set it up. Domain masking says, no, no, like we're the CDN, 
We're managing all the traffic that's going to example.com. Everything in there we're managing so we can be smart. We can say, look, if it's example.com slash blog, go to this whole other server, pull a copy of WordPress. If it's slash forum, we can go to this other server and have this whole copy of a forum, but they don't have to talk to each other on a sort of peer level. They all just get masked under this domain name. So I got a Mardi Gras mask from New Orleans because I was vibing that. But the idea is that you can basically continue to maintain multiple web properties under a single domain name, but instead of having them to have to share physical server space, they can be located in, if in fact in different parts of the world and all sort of work work under that, under that single domain masking heading, which I think is very excellent. Um, the other thing that I would, that if you don't support this now, you certainly will in the future, most modern CDNs do, is something called HTTPS2. So for like folks that saw, that, uh, the, it's a little small, I suppose, the graphic, but sort of old internet, HTTP1, was this protocol where you basically were able to take, uh, you load a page, and the page might actually have like 20 things on it, right? It's like, here's five style sheets, here's three JavaScript things, here's 10 images, and here's like the main doc document. And in the old HTTP1 era, the server has to round trip every single one of those assets. Um, and it's a limitation you might have seen if, you're, if you've done like, like I, I, uh, Internet Explorer Edge or old, old kind of browsers, they have limits on how many pages will load at the same time. And you sort of have this very tricky process of taking for n number of assets on the page, those are n number of connections that have to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. HTTP2 says, forget that, let's just put one connection that we multiplex. So we establish that sort of like link between the client and the server and we can then inject all of the assets through that. And that's a game changer for speed because that's something that we can then do quite quickly because we don't have to like reestablish, especially encrypted connections. And it's something that also just gets, uh, gets HTTPS by default. Like there's no other way to do HTTPS too. Like it has to be encrypted, that's part of the jam. And that's something that CDN, browsers already support. And that's something that CDNs can support for you. Instead of having to try to like reconfigure your web server to support this new technology, simply being on a CDN that already does, more truth, beauty, and wisdom on that. Um, and there's an HTTPS 3 coming, by the way, that'll add additional functionality on top of this. And sort of keeping up with that is, is obviously very, very important online. Because you can improve your performance of your site with a little security and sanity on the side. And you can improve it in ways that like should be very meaningful to your end users or to the search indexes that direct your end users to you. And so to try to explain exactly how this breaks down, here's sort of a CD, like not a, a traditional non-CDN operation where these are blue bars represent load time. Obviously the items represent the things that have to happen. And so what you're seeing here is that in order to even to get to time to first byte, the first information that's transmitted about the page itself, we're spending a second and a half, even more, just doing that TCP back and forth, doing that TLS negotiation, sending my HTML command, and then getting a response back. All of that is, and that takes even longer the further away the server is, just to get time to first byte, and then we have to do some additional stuff just to even be able to load the page. So we're three and a half seconds before the page is loaded. Not the worst, but that's also sort of slow. If we, if we bust into CDN with the sort of standard HTTP 1 version, we can see we can actually still accelerate what's going on a lot because we have a closer geographic uh, connection point so we can load quicker. We have the ability to have caching sort of through the layer. And then our time to first paint can in fact be very similar to page loaded. And now we've loaded this thing in a second and a half. And this is 100% the kind of gains you'll, you likely will see if you move from a no CDN model to a CDN model. Something definitely to try and test. Because simply knocking off two seconds every time somebody loads the page is a huge benefit to everyone who's going to the website. Like it's two seconds, everyone gets back in their day to read more content and do more stuff. But we can obviously gin this a bit more. If you're doing that full HTTP2 kind of experience, 
you're not having to spend any time at all in the additional TCP negotiations because you simply do the crypto handshake once and then stream all of the assets. And that you're very, very possibly able to deliver pages in less than a second, which is an absolute standard, great, great place to be on the web. If your website's loading in less than a second, you've done a good job in most cases of delivering content quickly, it's clearly for your users. And in some cases, you can get this by simply putting a CD in front of your site. Like you don't even have to do other stuff. But the smarter and cooler you can be, the faster you can be. And that's something that I would obviously emphasize to everyone today to, to, to get on. And it's important for other reasons, just fast is good. Google's page rank al algorithm specifically uses time to first byte as a metric to decide how high you are barred Google you are. So if you want to get the information out about what you're doing, certainly if you're in a competitive business or, or academic or, or, or other, other place where you're trying to be noticed, getting that speed up is just going to help you be more visible in Google. I've seen sites that literally will jump to the front page of Google for doing nothing more than putting a CDN because the change is that meaningful to what they ultimately, ultimately are doing. And there's a lot of interesting articles out there talking about the actual effects and how it sort of might help you. Um, but you know, just beyond like users are happier when things are, are, things are fast, typically. Um, here's a, yeah, and this is one of the Moz did a study a, a while back, but sort of showing how like just, you know, relatively modest, honestly, improvements in, in page performance uh, lead, to, lead to improvements in search rank position. Um, plus, of course, you know, Google wants you to go to the site, you know, go to sites you like, and fast sites obviously are pretty good. Um, and mobile search, by the way, even more so. That mobile users on, on search get different results than, um, than desktop users. And that mobile page, speed is, mobile page speed is even more important for the mobile devices because you know waiting like five seconds on your phone totally sucks. So Google is going to prioritize the pages that are optimized for mobile first. And I think that like sort of overall, like the future on all of this stuff is going to be very fast. That all of the intention behind these these cloud companies and these edge companies is to try to deliver content as quickly as possible. And that there are things today that we're doing even with inside of Drupal, the application, that ultimately are things that can be done on, on, the, on the edge. And people like, you know, doing like offloading comments to external services, offloading image management, offloading content uh, syndication, even just decoupling the entire application into different areas, leverage increasingly a lot of this kind of CDN technology. And I would say that like, you know, part of mastering the CDN, part of like continually being engaged and impressed with CDN sort of is, you know, follow a few of the CDN providers on Twitter, try out a few different CDNs, see what their feature sets are. Um, definitely try sort of to look at modern comparisons between CDNs. You can ask for like Fastly versus Cloudflare comparison. But in almost all cases, make sure you're getting something from 2019, 2018, because this, this space is changing very quickly and there's a lot of new stuff that's happening. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of vibes on the CDN. Thank you for paying attention for the last 45 minutes. And I hope everyone, of course, has a good GovCon. Um, I've got to take some questions. I know there's another talk here in this room in about 10 minutes. But uh, how are people feeling? Anyone want to install a CDN right now? <laughs> All right, yes. First of all, good great talk. Um, 